Hello, this is Olivia Olson, and you're listening to The Bigger Picture, a podcast where we interview scholars about how their research can make our communities better and more democratic. Today, we're going to discuss a new piece on social safety nets written in partnership between the Sol Price Center for Social Innovation and Imagine LA. The report is called Examining the Complex Social Safety Net for Low-Income Working Families, How Benefits and Resources Respond to Increases in Wages. I'm fortunate to be joined by so many guests today who I will allow to introduce themselves now. My name is Gary Painter. It's a pleasure to be back on the Bigger Picture podcast. Um, I am the director of the Price Center for Social Innovation and the Homelessness Policy Research Institute. Hi, everyone. I'm Soledad de Gregorio. I'm a postdoc scholar at the Price Center for Social Innovation at USC. Uh, My work examines social policy, particularly homelessness, housing, and education, and how they impact families and children. Thank you for the invitation. Hi, my name is Jill Bauman. I'm the president and CEO of Imagine LA. Hi, I'm Britt Gilmore, and I am a social impact consultant that is working with Imagine LA on economic mobility. Hi, my name is Leilani Reed. I am an ambassador for Imagine LA. Well, thank you all so much for joining me today. I'm really, really excited to discuss this piece and to share it with our listeners. To get things started, Gary, would you mind giving us a quick summary of your report? Yeah, and if I, I'll just tell a, a little brief story. The, the issues that motivated this report have, have been with us ever since the social safety net was begin to be created in the U.S. back in the 30s and certainly accelerated through the war on poverty in the 60s. Um, thinking back to when I began my dissertation work at Berkeley in the early 90s, there was a lot of concern that while the social safety net provides support for working families and, and families that are, are not able to work, it also, also might hold them back from actually being able to end up earning living wage jobs because while they were working and earning more income, they might actually lose benefits in their entirety. And if you go back 20 years or so, there were many benefits that just kind of dropped off, especially and most importantly, the Medicare um, benefits, I'm sorry, the Medicaid benefits that here in California are called Medi-Cal. Um, and in many ways, 20 years hence of kind of a, a really important analysis that Barbara Wolf did, um, we were really excited to kind of reinvestigate um, how the social safety net works to support working families because our kind of social welfare system here in the United States really has shifted to kind of the mindset to support working families as opposed to support families that are in need and perhaps are working or not working. And so it was really an important time to to reestablish what we wanted to do there. And so this report actually investigated roughly 15 different social safety net programs. And we'll say more about kind of what we did in terms of that process and also how how we, um, what are the major findings uh, shortly? Fantastic, thank you so much. I I think one of the things that's really unique and exciting about this piece is your partnership with the nonprofit organization, Imagine LA. So I would love to pass it over to Jill to share a little bit about what Imagine LA does and why they as well are invested in addressing this topic. Uh, Thank you, Gary, and uh, thank you, Olivia. Um, Imagine LA, you know, we're a a nonprofit. We've been around for about 15 years and we work with families emerging from homelessness and low income families. And um, our goal is to end both the cycle of homelessness and poverty. Um, And we work to help families maintain their housing and and really thrive long term. And um, We, just to give a sense of the scope of of our work, we work with, we'll work with approximately 230 families this year. And these uh, families, about 86% of them are headed by single single moms. And about 86% are um, black indigenous people of color. Um, So just to get you a sense of, um, and uh, more than half of them live in the South LA region of Los Angeles, and then the rest are sort of scattered. So how we work with these families is through our partner, our family partnership model, where the, the basically we come alongside the family and we work with them with intensive case management, 
looking at every member of the family, all their needs. Um, then we also bring mentorship to every member of the family over five. And then the third piece, this, uh, the piece that we're really gonna be focusing on today and why the study is on economic mobility. And we're really, we take a, um, a deep dive there. Um, and in about three years ago, we were doing all these things, getting people jobs, da, 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 so much with our families and they were getting jobs and so forth. And they, um, but they were still enmeshed in poverty, you know, like getting just a job was not, it was not, it was not, uh, not getting them off into the world of being financially independent. And so we started looking much harder at that. And we looked hard at one, what is a living wage job? So like we're working on that. Second, what childcare needs? Uh, you know, these are single headed families. We've got to deal with the childcare. Third, what financial acumen, uh, what, what skills do people need to learn? What knowledge do they need to have in order to, um, you know, be smart with their money? And fourth is, what was the impact of the social services, of our safety net or our benefits? And what, what, what was that impact on this whole uh, poverty thing? And because for us, it looked, you know, there's all these different benefits in all these different, you know, coming from federal, state, local, and, you know, and, you know, the Department of Agriculture is doing what's now what used to be called food stamps. And the Department of this is doing this and they're not coordinated and they're not um, and there's different benefits flowing from it. And we can't can't see this. And as people were starting to make more money, all of a sudden the benefit would fall away. And we're like, what? What happened? And we really, really wanted to, so this, and this was affecting how our families acted. You know, if they make more money, were they gonna lose childcare? They make more money, were they gonna lose their food? You know, like what, what, so there's a whole fear factor around that. And, but we, when we looked and looked and we couldn't find what, what was happening, you know, like there was no, single resource guy that didn't exist that told you you know what was going on and exactly how rises in income for different kinds of families with different different age kids or different you know places along the along the way you know how would it affect it they didn't exist and we were just like you gotta be kidding me and then we found gary <laughs> and usc and well and said, hey, can we go into this black box and figure this out? And um, and that's what you're going to learn about today. And it's really exciting because it can, what's coming out of it can really help families get out of, out of poverty. So. Well, that is wonderful. And I'm, I'm really interested to hear later on about your collaboration and how you sought each other out and what this research process entailed. But before we get into that, I'm really curious to hear from Leilani, our ambassador for Imagine LA. Could you share with us a little bit about your experience, both with Imagine LA and some of these social safety net programs we'll be discussing? Um, yes, I heard about Imagine LA about six years ago when I was living at Good Shelter, a shelter for women and children. And I was so excited to be a part of their program. And once I got involved in their program, my family team manager, she provided me with clinical case management and um, she shared numerous resources um, with me, including um, skill training opportunities, um, stress release classes, mommy and me classes, reading to the kids on Thursday classes. Um, and my family team manager, she would encourage me to participate in Imagine LA Save and Match program. And she would celebrate me every time I made a sacrifice. And when she would do that, I would save more. And she would follow up with me to make sure that I was meeting all of my goals and that I was keeping up with my bills on time. And then their mentorship program, I had a mentor, my son had a mentor, we would meet weekly, my son's mentor helped him, you know, look for colleges and scholarships. Now my son is in um, Atlanta, Georgia, he goes to Morehouse on a full scholarship, 
and his mentor is still part of his life. My mentor is still part of my life. And uh, one of the pieces with Imagine LA is the financial fitness program. I love it. These classes are amazing. You have the credit um, workshop, home ownership workshop, um, different um, insurance, life insurance, rentals insurance, banking and savings. And they're just teaching you how to clean and build your credit and work your way to self-sufficiency, home ownership. And now I went from saving $25 a month to $100 a month. And I clearly understand what a rainy day fund means. I thought it was having enough money to buy a spare tire or to fix my brakes. But now I understand is to have um, funds that, that will hold you from six months to a year where you can sustain your rent and your bills. So it was, you know, very informational um, for me. Wow, that is amazing. And, and I'm curious yes. how you found out about Imagine LA. Um, through the shelter. They had a, um, they had a, um, a workshop and um, Imagine LA had some, um, a team come in to tell about their program because as you exit, you have to be in permanent housing to be a part of their program. So I was about to exit. So I went to the meeting. And then when I was listening to all what they did, it was like, okay, I need this, you know, because now I'm going into permanent housing. So, you know, it's still a fear because I was homeless, but I was secure because I was at the shelter. Now I'm going on my own. So Imagine LA was right there and their program was amazing. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing what an incredible experience and an incredible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, with that in mind, speaking of how different people and organizations found each other, I'm, I'm curious to get back to that earlier question about how the Center for, for Social Innovation and, and Imagine LA found each other and came together to work on this project. Well, um, we decided that we were not going to settle for the black box of, uh, of, of social benefits. And um, Britt, who is my, uh, who you'll meet in a, just a little bit, Britt uh, Moore Gilmore, who's my partner in um, economic mobility, um, when we were working on the living wage and all of these things, we both was like, okay, who? And so Britt, who is also a Trojan, um, uh, said, you know, I, there's some great work being done out of, uh, out of price. And, um, and she inquired if they'd be interested. And then, um, you know, she was our matchmaker. And uh, um, I think, I can't remember exactly how it all went, but then we found Gary, who has been thinking about this work and actually did, I think, his dissertation back way back when on related work. Um, and it, it was sort of a match made in heaven. And um, I think what was interesting was that we were talking about it from the ground up. You know, we were talking about it like, let's take scenarios of, you know, of single moms with kids this age and that age. Let's not talk about it like policy up here. Let's talk about real people and what they have to navigate. And what is really happening? And um, it was kind of fun as uh, Soledad, who really, you know, put her whole team together, um, and Gary, um, uh, as they started discovering all these different benefits and how they all worked. Um, so uh, that's that's what happened, and it was it's just been a really a fantastic journey and really interesting. Also, like going to the actual agencies and getting the data from them and, and then actually waiting for them to verify that what we found is true. And it was, um, it, it's been a really interesting process and I'm just so grateful for their partnership. It's been fantastic. That's, that's wonderful. One of, one of my favorite things that you just mentioned was about how you're following these different circumstances and you're talking about policy at the ground level. And I, I think one of the major strengths of this piece is its accessibility. And we'll later discuss the structure and how you discuss these policy recommendations. And, and that was one of the things that brought this to our attention through the bigger picture, because we really want to focus on 
research, not as something that happens in, in academic buildings, but as something that has the potential to shape policy, shape public opinion and be impactful. So once again, I'm really grateful for you all to be here and excited to get to talk about the, the bulk of the work. And to start, I wanted to ask, maybe Soledad, you could speak to this. Do you have for our listeners just a couple of definitions of the really key crucial terms like resource plateaus, benefits cliffs, anything else that you think may help guide the, the layperson listener to really understand what you're getting at in this paper? Sure, yes, um, I can help with those definitions. So first, when we talk about total resources, what we're really trying to do here is to calculate estimate the monetary value of all the resources a family has available at different income levels. So this includes their earned income and everything they may receive through social benefits that they are eligible for. And those social benefits may be through cash assistance or through services. And so if it's a service, we estimated the monetary value of it. So for example, healthcare, and that's how we add it, pull it all together. And when we talk about total resources available to that family, is it's all that together. And then benefit cliffs, which you will also see in the report and we will talk about is when an increase in earnings leaves a family with lower resources overall. Of these total resources, they're lower when you increase your earnings because there's a decrease in the social benefits that's outweighing the increase in benefits. So even though you may be working extra hours and increasing your income by a certain amount, that may mean you are losing benefits that are outweighing those earnings. Um, and I see Leilani nodding. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, resource plateau is when this increase in earnings leaves the family no better off. So that means that your overall resources aren't changing, you, your earnings are increasing, but your social benefits are decreasing by an equal amount. And so you're left um, pretty much the same after that. The big difference there is that because you are increasing your earnings, there's a, a larger piece of that that you can assign directly um, versus if it's, if it's more from benefits, those are tied sometimes, especially if they're in services, you can't uh, decide how to allocate those. So Very those are some key definitions. <laughs> Thank you. And Leilani, given that you were nodding your head, could you could you speak a little bit to your experience with some of these different phenomena, how how the process of navigating benefits cliffs, resource, resource plateaus, how that transpired and what what sort of experiences you had navigating that? Yes, um, this happened to me in 2010. Um, I was enrolled in, in rapid rehousing and my children were the ages of 8, 16, 18, and 21. When my kids were under the age of 18, I started receiving government assistance in the form of cash aid, Medi-Cal, and food stamps. Once I started working and generating more money, my benefits started disappearing. To qualify for many benefits, it is based on a few factors, family size, income being the largest factor. The trouble came in when my kids started becoming adults and no longer enabled me to qualify for certain benefits as my family size was decreasing. I went from a family of five to a family of three to a family of two, all because my kids had a birthday. I had gone over a benefit cliff without even knowing it, all because my kids had a birthday. I was working part-time for the city of Los Angeles um, for Wrecking Parks, and I was a staff at a girl's group home. And then I became an in-home supportive worker for IHSS. So now I have clients and I'm making more money. First thing to go was my cash aid. So now I just have food stamps and Medi-Cal, which is California social health care um, program. Then my benefits, then my food stamps got cut and other benefits started, you know, disappearing. Cash aid, Food stamps and Medi-Cal are three different entities, but all of the requirements and income levels are different. You can make more with Medi-Cal than for cash aid or food stamps. You will get cut faster with the cash aid. That, that goes real fast. 
so when it came time for me um, getting my taxes done, my tax guy told me I was technically middle class <laughs> because my salary at that time was 25000 and the poverty line for a family of three in 2010, are you guys ready for this? Was $18,310, but I'm middle class. <laughs> I was blessed to have a tax guy that understood the social safety net and my position. And he accessed some information and provided um, solutions that showed me that I was eligible for certain tax credit but I still needed access to community resources. And today I live in subsidized housing, which is section eight. And I still live in uncertainty because I don't know the limits and you know, the system, you know, it's broken and I'm still in fear of being at risk of being homeless because the more money I make, the higher my rent goes, everything, you know, goes up and then everything is decreased for me. Yeah. So. That's what I experienced. Wow. Well, w- one of the things that really stuck out to me was this repetition ab- about not even knowing it, that yeah. you know, as, as your wages increase, so too do your contributions to certain subsidies and you become ineligible for certain programs and happy birthday to your children. <laughs> you too. But you, had, you were fortunate to have this tax guide who on some levels knew the system and, and knew how to take advantage of them. But right. I still see that there are so many gaps in the information that is widely available. And one of the things that I think is really exciting about this piece is the social benefit calculator. And I'm curious to discuss that a little bit and see, Leilani, how you think that would have changed your circumstances, made, made it a more transparent experience for you. Brett, would you speak to the social benefit cal- calculator and tell our listeners about what it does and how it could help Leilani and people who are in similar situations? Absolutely. So the social benefit calculator is uh, a calculator to help low-income families and their case managers better understand the interaction between all these government benefit streams and changes in, in earned income with the ultimate goal of helping families exit poverty. So the way that this would work is that a family would sit with their case manager, provide information about their government benefits that they're receiving, their family size, and other factors that affect their benefits eligibility, as well as what their expected either new income will be, current income, or um, changes in income as a result of a, a promotion. And then this calculator spits out a simple data visualization of how their government benefits will decrease over time Um, according to the increase in their wages. And then this output of the calculator is something that they and their case manager would review together and come up with a strategy for how to navigate those benefits cliffs and plateaus that could look like potentially utilizing emergency funds if that's something that the agency provides. Um, It could also be creating a budget on existing income or even taking a step back to rethink what career path might make the most sense in terms of the family's needs and the benefits they're receiving and the income that they they need to be in a financially sustainable place. So that's the functionality of the tool. And we just know that families and individuals um, that are navigating a low income scenario really need accessible and transparent information about benefits eligibility, what these cliffs look like, how they're gonna be impacted by them and that families and case managers often don't know when changes to their benefits are going to occur, like Leilani just shared, um, and then how much income will trigger those changes. So we wanna make sure that case managers are also getting the information that they need on what benefits their, their families and clients are eligible for, as well as what like living wage workforce training programs are out there and available to participate in. So we're trying to bring all of those pieces together to really create transparency, and uh, the opportunity to, to really look at all of this holistically and come up with a plan. Britt, thank you. Um, I think one of the, the things, and I can't wait for Gary uh, and Soledad to talk about this, but when sometimes when these benefit cliffs happen, just like what happened to 
Leilani, where she found out be because she happened to have a savvy accountant that there were, were tax credits on, on the other side that could help fill in that that gap. And I think the patchwork of all of our benefits, there are often other benefits that can fill in these gaps, but people don't know what they are. So part of what the calculator and what we hope other work coming out of this study will be to be able to put transparency and, and more clarity around if, if a benefit goes away, what, what, what else could happen? You know, what, what, other, what other opportunities are there, um, you know, could, uh, for, for families or for individuals? And is this tool one that you envision creating all on your own or is this or is this calculator something you would rather see created and implemented by local state or federal governments what's what's your ideal scenario outcome with this tool um i think if we want to do it fast we better do it ourselves <laughs> <laughs> um, but um but uh, we are looking for it at looking as it as something that we will share and be as collaborative as possible it's for the people so um i wouldn't and, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm interested, as you all know now, with Imagine Lay and with in general with families, and helping them get out of poverty as quickly as we can. So um, uh, we're going to give it a go. Well, that is fantastic. And and before moving on from our discussion of the social benefit calculator, I'm curious, Leilani, how you think access to that tool may have impacted your experience or the experience of those who didn't have the same helpful tax guide? For sure, the social benefit calculator, this tool, if it had existed back then, it would have been just so beneficial for me and for other families because you know, it's kind of like how rapid rehousing worked with the families. You know, within six months that that six months, you're responsible for this full amount of rent. So I'm aware of that. So they go from taking you from 20% to 30% to 40%, gradually, you know, taking you off and you going into self-sufficiency. So I think this calculator, a lot of people, <laughs> it's like the medicine, you know, to get out of poverty, you know, and, and but in a helpful way and not just snatching people where, you know, all you're doing is living and this is what you know, and then it just snatched from you and you're like, whoa, okay, I wasn't prepared. But this way you're more prepared, you're understanding and you have building blocks, you know, as you go. So yeah, this tool, yes, it's beneficial. And I think it should go statewide, however many levels high it can go, <laughs> it needs to go. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see, to see what comes of this. And hopefully there is some, some fast work on, on making this an implementable reality for everyone who needs it. But I would like to move on from the social benefit calculator and, and more generally discuss the findings of the research. And Gary or Soledad, perhaps I can direct this following question at you. What, what do you consider to be the most significant findings from your research? Well, the first uh, thing I'd like to note is that um, our approach to working with amazing partners has clearly been validated. So our most important finding is to continue to work with the social innovators who are doing the work. And as you've already heard, they really explained what's happening in this ecosystem. Um, and while Soledad and our team at the Price Center were able to kind of actually go through the nuts and bolts of all of these 15 different benefits at the federal, state, and local level to kind of create, this is what the ecosystem looks like. It is the work of people like Imagine LA that, and, and Lilani's really just lived story of how she navigated along the way that can really point the path forward for what we ought to be doing. Um, I'll say this, uh, just in the beginning, and let Soledad jump on a couple of her, you know, most important findings. I think we needed to know one question is, is the social safety net in the US enough for anybody? Um, just to kind of first let's establish, do we have a social safety net that can actually support 
families so that they have enough resources to live. And so one of the first things we did is we calculated, you know, based on an MIT living wage calculator, you know, do we actually, you know, can the social safety net approach that, which roughly in a city like Los Angeles, because of our higher cost of living is roughly, you need about $66,000 of resources um, or equivalent services. Um, what we found out is perhaps a sliver of good news, but it's unfortunately accompanied with not good news, um, is that actually if someone is so destitute, and this is one of our not so good news pieces, you have to have almost no assets and almost very little income under $12,000 of income to have the chance of qualifying for everything. Um, if that's the case, then there actually are sufficient resources in our social safety net. And that's the good news part. The other piece of bad news, in addition to having to be so destitute to qualify for everything, which just, it shouldn't have to be that way, that you have to actually hit your rock bottom before you can get the support you need, um, is that it requires you to actually receive housing assistance. And the most important and largest benefit that is available in the social safety net are the, is the housing choice vouchers or housing assistance tied to places. Um, this voucher, unfortunately, is only being received by one in five eligible households at present. And that number keeps increasing in terms of the eligible versus those who get it. So it was, when we started this project, the research said it was one in four. Now it's one in five. It's going absolutely in the wrong direction. So if that's the case, it says the social safety net is only possibly supportive enough for only 20 to 25% of households. So that should actually give us pause in terms of just what is there for families. It could be supportive enough if you get everything, but right now it's it's not for only, I should say it, it's not for probably 70 to 80% of households. So that's something that to me was both some good news and some bad news. Um, and I'll leave it to Soledad to kind of share or other findings that we really thought were important for people to, to really walk with in this work. Thank you, thank you, Gary, yes. Um, I would say one of our first findings is that yes, there is a social safety net in place. And as you said, unfortunately you have to fall very low to be caught by this net. Um, we also find that as expected benefits do decrease as income increase, earned income increases. With the exception of tax credits, um, the ones that are intended to incentivize work like EITC, those increase as income increases um, because again, they're incentivized, uh, they're intended to incentivize work. Um, at the lowest income levels, they're rising. Um, but we find that overall programs tend to fade out gradually. And if they don't, the end of one program oftentimes is met with the eligibility into a new program. So for example, when childcare vouchers end, um, the child and dependent care tax credit kicks in. Families become uh, are now eligible for that tax credit to cover some of their childcare costs. And also with, the, uh, um, with Medi-Cal, when an individual is no longer eligible for Medi-Cal, then Affordable Care Act or, or Covered California healthcare plans are available to them. So that is something that we also find that some of these cliffs that we could have found are softened because you transition from, from one program to the next. But another really important finding, and, and this is one of our main takeaways and why the calculator is, is so important, is that really navigating the system is complicated. As time has gone on and we've um, added the number of social benefits and programs available to families, this, this net has really become more and more complicated to navigate. And so in order for a family to be able to anticipate changes and actually receive the full coverage they, they're entitled to, they have to understand the eligibility rules and not only the eligibility rules of the different programs, but once you determine if you're eligible, you have to determine how much you will actually receive from the program. And those sometimes are two completely different calculations. Um, and that, can be very, very difficult to do. Um, it took our team months of research uh, with a lot of time dedicated to this. As Jill mentioned, we also had a lot of back and forth with experts to try 
to make sure that all the estimates, to actually make sure that all the estimates we were coming up with were, were accurate. Um, and I suspect that families struggling likely don't have neither the tools nor the time, even with the assistance of, of some caseworkers to fully understand the complexities of the social safety net and to actually, I wouldn't say take advantage, but actually like take full, um, take full coverage of, of what they can, they can receive. Um, and the other finding as well, um, similar to what Gary said, was that we found that supporting families with housing and childcare expenses is really, really crucial for families to be able to, re to reach a living wage. Um, and this living wage we use, we based it off of the MIT living wage calculator, um, which is a point where they can cover their basic expenses depending on their household size. And only what we found is that only once families receive both housing vouchers and child care coverage, are they able to reach that living wage? Um, if not, under no circumstances, like even working full time at a minimum wage job, they would not be able to cover the, that basic living wage. So it was not just housing, but additionally child care that were both necessary programs for families to reach the, the living wage. Yes, yes. And that's in, in this case, we were particularly looking into a single parent family with two young kids. And so the bulk of their monthly expenditures goes towards housing and child care. And so, yes, those two programs are key specifically for, for a family like that. Once children become older, um, then childcare uses up a smaller percentage, but it's still a really important portion. Thank you. Thank you, Soledad and Gary. That was really wonderful. I think two of the, the main takeaways that, that I had from what you shared to sort of synthesize all of that wonderful research is both the really central role of housing subsidies and, and the issue that is faced by those being much more scarce than the demand requires them to be, but also this, this lack of information. And it's wonderful that as the social security nets have gotten broader, there are more programs, but that uh, a negative outcome of that is that people are less aware of how to be covered in the ways that they need to be covered as their circumstances change. And I think that that goes back to what Leilani shared with us and also really underscores the importance of, of the calculator and giving these families tools to be acutely aware and well attuned to the resources that do exist to help them as their circumstances change. And with that in mind, I'd love to turn to your policy recommendations and, and start with housing. Increasing access to housing subsidies was one of your, your main policy proposals for how we can help these families. And, and I'm curious, how do we generate the political will? How do we build new housing? What, what needs to be done from a policy standpoint, from a zoning standpoint, a construction standpoint to make housing subsidies more accessible? Well, I'll begin on that, uh, something that I've studied my whole career, and I wrote a recent op-ed that was published in Barron's to comment on what the Biden administration has proposed as it relates to housing and you know where it succeeds and where it falls short of achieving the broad-based goals that were actually in the platform that Biden had when he was running for, for president to begin with. Um, I, I think that most people see um, that you, it's not tenable to have this gap of one in five people who are eligible receive this benefit. The benefit that's the most important benefit in the social safety net, that isn't tenable. The Biden administration's platform before he was elected said, we're going to make it an entitlement. That's what we should do. And I think that um, that idea of supporting people in that way, given they're eligible, is absolutely essential. But you mentioned Olivia. Um, it's where we need to go, but how do we get there? How do we build the political will? 
are there some interim steps that we can take so that you don't move from the current budgetary allocation to a larger budgetary allocation? And moving to that larger budgetary allocation, do we actually incentivize structures around planning and so forth to make sure that new housing is built so that there is more housing that can be made affordable for individuals and families because of these subsidies? So in terms of getting there, I think it was an important set of proposals that um, then candidate Kamala Harris and Cory Booker were in favor of a renter's tax credit. Um, we've also proposed in some of our work at the Price Center and the Homelessness Policy Research Institute, what might be a, I call it a housing subsidy in waiting, which would basically provide people who are paying more than half their income as rent, a smaller subsidy while they wait for their full subsidy in the Housing Choice Voucher Federal Program. I think the, that amount of money is just absolutely essential. I, you can't imagine how much, how difficult it is. Um, and I, I would say, I shouldn't say you can't imagine. Lalani imagines it very clear because she lived it. And so many other people are living it. Um, in California, 1.2 million households pay more than half their income as rent. Those people are all at risk with one big bill of not being able to pay rent anymore. We have to do something to, to reduce the housing insecurity for, for those families. And so I think perhaps in the short term, what we could do is provide smaller subsidies while people wait for the vouchers that they're eligible for. Um, I would like to get all the way there where we provide, make the Housing Choice Voucher Program an entitlement. I don't know that that's politically feasible in the near term, but I think there are concrete steps that states might be able to make. The state of California could choose to do that. It's not within with, without the, uh, the realm of like budgetary possibilities. And if you did that, you would reduce homelessness, which is a huge cost, both in terms of people's lives um, and the impacts of having to experience homelessness, but also just the actual services that they are, are um, receive. If you just stopped people from becoming homeless to begin with, then you would save money down the road. So that's, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about housing insecurity issues. Um, I could talk about it for, for a lot longer, but I better uh, stop so that my colleagues can jump in on their uh, preferred policy and uh, recommendations. Thank you, Gary, that was wonderful. So we discussed the pol uh, some of the different policy recommendations a little bit in the context of the social benefit calculator, but does anyone have anything they would like to add about the policy recommendations, particularly in the context of how do we accomplish this? Jill, can I call on you? Yes, please. Um, uh, so I think one of the things that we really found, you know, taking a sort of a big picture and then going more granular, is that we found through this research that the social safety net is designed to be a net. It doesn't, it doesn't quite work with the housing piece, as Gary has just said, and we've got to really deal with that. And I, I'm, I'm in the Gary camp, although I don't know, I think it would might be, I'm, or I'm in favor of some housing subsidies being time-based, not forever, um, because I do think like Lalani was telling, talking about before, is if you create some structures and and people and they they do have what it they could get so that they don't need the subsidy, you know, it's a realistic time frame. I think um, I think for certain populations, certain people um, that so that it wouldn't be a forever benefit. Um, so that's m maybe the only little bit I I. Uh, I differ from Gary, but he probably thinks that too. Um, but uh, the thing that I want to sort of focus on a little bit from policy is one of the things we noticed is that these the way that each of these benefits streams are structured, they end up like a net and they end up being kind of sticky because you you know, if you raise your income and another one goes down, how much in, how much uh, incentive do you have to really raise your income? You know, like what's happening, you know, there. And I would love to figure out, I'd love, and, you know, we're hopefully going to advocate for this going forward, is ways where the, the benefits 
could have more incentive to work. I know the tax stuff is really working on that, but how could how could these be working together to help people get out of poverty and do it in a way that feels motivating and um, you know uh, not like you're sort of fighting against the policy sort of, you know, like that we're all in it together to to um, get um, people, if they're able-bodied enough, if they're, you know, they're, if they have, you know, because not everybody's the same, right? But if they are able to really help them get to financial independence, um, not have it feel like a sticky, you know, I remember um solidad when she finally got like a graph of all the benefits she was just like oh my god it's like a bunch of spaghetti you know like um if we could get it so it really was feeling more like a springboard and less than like a sticky spider web do you, do you know and i think policy you really got it's going to be it's going to be a big lift you got to get all those policy makers with all those different in the same room and you got to start, you know, hope maybe our calculator, we could run data through it to show um, what the impacts would have, you know, to really start um, having uh, it, the uh, people feel equipped and empowered um, to towards financial empowerment. Uh, you know, both, you know, it's a and not a but. It's an and, not a but. That's 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 the critical part right there. Mm -hmm. And I know that you are all so busy and took all this time to be fantastic and tell me about your wonderful new piece. I would love to give you a chance, all of you, to add anything that you wished we'd have covered. But otherwise, I would love to let you enjoy your Wednesday evenings. Does anyone have anything else they want to make sure we highlight? Okay, I will take that as uh, we all want to go to dinner now. <laughs> so with that, I would love to thank you all so much for joining me today. It was really an honor to talk with all of you and hear about the wonderful work that you're doing. And to our listeners, thank you for listening to The Bigger Picture. For links to some of the really fantastic, interesting things that we discussed today that you should definitely look up, visit our show page bedrosian.usc.edu slash big picture. And if you have more questions for our speakers or topics you'd like us to cover, let us know. Check out our website, social media, or even email us. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app and leave a review so other people can find us. Until we catch up again, we hope you will take care of yourself and your neighbors from all of us at the USC Bedrosian Center. Thank you again and have an excellent evening.